Swami and welcome. I'm Catherine Perry and today, as many of you, the Northern Marianas Humanities Council is watching the protests that are happening around the nation, around the world, and even here in the Marianas that are bringing attention to a long-standing problem in our community, which is racial inequality. And as many of you know, um, a disproportionate number of African Americans in America have been discriminated against by um, institutions such as law enforcement, courts, media, financial institutions. And uh, these protests are a reminder that our freedoms do need to be protected against those that would oppress or exclude others. So um, we're hosting this series of conversations on racial equality and civil unrest. And the goal basically is to really facilitate a deeper understanding of these issues and some discussion from both a national and local perspective. And starting off on our series, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bailal Solomon. Uh, she's an associate professor at Northern Marianas College School of Education. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Well, we're very pleased that you agreed to kind of start, up, start us off on this series and you have a PhD in developmental psychology. That's correct. So uh, we asked, may I call you Bailal? Sure. Okay, great, thanks. <laughs> uh, we asked Bailal if she could kind of start us off with a broad picture of what is racial equality, what is civil unrest from both the perspective of the individual and um, the society. So um, looking forward to our chat today, but the first thing I wanted to ask you was, what do you think about what's going on? You know, uh, it, it's, it seems like it's such a, a crazy time in our world today. I mean, not just with uh, the protests and that, that are happening throughout the country and throughout the world, quite frankly, uh, but you know, even with the pandemic, it, it's just a, a perfect storm of, uh, of, of societal issues that are being mm. brought to light. And, and, and people are being forced to really take a look at themselves, look at the mirror, look at their own you know, image in the mirror and, and, and uh, challenge their beliefs and, and ideas. So I think it's a very exciting time, uh, in, even though there's, uh, but, it, but it's brought, been brought about by a lot of pain and suffering. Mm. So um, I, I'm hoping that these protests are gonna really uh, bring about some systemic changes in our society. Well, I think an imp important thing to remember during times like this is, is the, the um, power of words, which is why we kind of wanted to start off making sure that we are all talking about the same thing when mm -hmm. we talk about uh, racial equality, when we talk about civil unrest, because people are looking at what's happening in different ways, I think. And um, so could you, um, and then also, um, from the, when it comes to addressing um, racial equality, it's not only what we think as individuals, it's also, as I mentioned, the um, larger institutions in society, and they both may need adjustment, which mm -hmm. is why we're taking this approach. So what is racial equality? When we say that, what are we talking about and what does it look like? That's a great question. Uh, so racial equality is the idea that um, your socioeconomic outcomes, uh, your life is not determined by the color of your skin. Um, it's the, it's the, the systems and the policies in place that are uh, making sure that uh, there is true situational fairness and equal opportunity in our society for all people. Um, and, and for uh, racial equality to be achieved, you know, you really have to be able to give all people the mechanisms uh, that they need to thrive in their, in their life. So, I, you know, I can think of several factors in terms of what does it look like. Um, so, uh, for example, you know, vulnerable communities need to have access to mechanisms that would allow them to achieve social mobility. What I mean by that is they need to have access to education, health care, uh, access to, you know, equal representation in government, things of that nature. Um, second thing, I, uh, I believe that also in order to achieve uh, racial equality, we need to be, uh, we need to have people, all people, including people of color, be the owners, the planners, the decision makers, and the systems that are governing their lives. The leaders. The leaders, right. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, if we take uh, the U.S. government for right now, if you look at the U.S. Senate, you know, out of the hundred people, it's, it's a sea of white men, uh, you know, and there's, I, I believe, three black people in the entire U.S. Senate. So you need to have 
all people be uh, included in, you know, in, in, um, in positions of power. Um, in addition, we also, in order to achieve racial equality, we need to able, be able to acknowledge uh, past racial inequities and current uh, racial inequities and provide those people who have you know, disproportionately been affected by these racial inequities the infrastructure that they need to, to thrive. Um, so those are some of the things. And, uh, and, 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 and also, importantly, uh, we need to be able to um, value all cultures, all identities, you know, equally, uh, because our strength comes from diversity. It really does. I think one of the challenges, challenges in particular for America is, as you mentioned, the past racial inequalities. And there can be a thought like, um, the civil rights movement happened, um, we're over this, especially if you're not a member of one of those classes that is um, treated unfairly, which we were kind of talking about mm -hmm. before we started the show. But um, can you give us a little bit of an understanding of how what happened in the past can still affect people today, especially in America? You know, so for that, you know, we're what we're really talking about is institutional racism. Mm -hmm. um, so institutional racism is, 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 is systemic. It's a, system, it's, a, it's a form of racism that's expressed in our social and political um, uh, systems. Um, and it's really, uh, it's hard to perceive uh, institutional racism because it's more subtle in nature. It's not as overt, it's not so obvious. Uh, so when we think about, um, I'll give you a great example uh, of, uh, of institutional racism uh, today. Um, that is mass incarceration. So um, let me see, what's, what's a good example that I could use? So uh, for example, there's you know, this big move in the 90s for the war on drugs. It started in the 70s with Nixon, but the war on drugs is a huge deal, which you know, it, a lot of laws were enacted to, to fight crime and things of that nature. So if we take, for example, marijuana. Uh, we know, stats, statistics show that uh, whites and African Americans use marijuana about the same amount. 13% of whites use marijuana, 13% of blacks use marijuana. Now, in the US population, 60% of uh, those people who, uh, of 60% uh, of the population is white, whereas there's only about 15% that are black. However, when you look at the number of people that are stopped, African Americans are four times more likely to be stopped for the use and possession of marijuana than whites. And so that shows you that there's a huge disparity in that. Um, and even when we're thinking of mass incarceration just in general, uh, the United States is about 5% of the world's population. And we have 25% of the world's prison population. So that means one in four people in the entire world is in prison in the United States in the land of the free. So. And those, those numbers tend to be overwhelmingly uh, African Americans. Mm -hmm. So that's where we start to see that there is some kind of disparity, unfairness, you know, unequalness in, in our society that needs to be addressed. That's an incredible number. I didn't realize that. Yeah. One fourth of all the people incarcerated in the world are being incarcerated in the, in United, the United States. States. Wow. Right. Um, some people, when it comes to racism, especially here in the Marianas, and we were chatting a little bit about this also, um, help us understand what is racism. For example, um, we have so many ethnicities here mm -hmm. in Saipan. I think it's like 22 or 26 on a 13 mile <laughs> island. I love to boast like we relatively all get along. Which yeah. Are, but I think anybody who's lived here for any amount of time of any ethnicity will feel that they've been discriminated against or somebody has said something against them because of their ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, how is this similar, how is this different from um, racism in the U.S. mainland? Um, so, I mean, I think first we need to start off by defining what is racism, Please right? Do. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Talking about defining. Uh, so, you know, racism is prejudice or discrimination or antagonism uh, against somebody of a different race, and it's based on the belief that your own race is superior, mm. right? And uh, and 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 this form of racism uh, can it really permeates the disparities throughout all our societies in terms of economic uh, wealth, income, employment, health, uh, education, criminal justice, you know, so these all uh, forms, these all, these social systems are then, the racism is 
permeating through all of our you know systems. So when we're thinking of racism in the Marianas, I mean, I'm I'm not an expert. <laughs> and you've lived here four years. I've li- I've been okay. here four years, yeah. um, and 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 there are you know it, it, you really have to think about um, how racism uh, develops. You know, where does it come from? Mm. Like, why do some people feel more superior or inferior to others? Right, um, and. In the Marianas, it's, it's, it's a very ethnically diverse group, so, uh, and, and racism is not something that's only against blacks and whites. You know, racism occurs ac- across all ethnicities and, and across all races. But uh, what's happening in the United States today is based on this idea of white supremacy, mm-hmm. um, which I can talk about if, if you'd like to talk about the roots yes. of racism. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, so when we think about you know, the roots of, of, of racism in the United States today, it really kind of goes back you have to look at the historical aspects in order to understand why people feel the way that they do about different races today. Mm. Uh, so when we think about historical aspects, it really starts with this perfect marriage of colonialism and Christianity. <laughs> uh, so in the, in, in the 1400s, uh, the Vatican Church gave authority to the Spanish and the, and the Portuguese to basically divide up the world and say you can you know, colonize and take over the lands of anybody who's not Christian. And so that gave you know, the Spaniards and, and the Portuguese, uh, the license to just go out and, and just decimate mm. uh, <laughs> uh, indigenous uh, people. And that happened here yeah. in the Marianas, you know, where the Spanish came and they pretty much obliterated 80 to 90 percent of the native, you know, Chamorro population, you know, through disease and, and like forced conversions. And, you know, and if you didn't follow my rules and you know, you're going to be, you know, slaughtered. Um, and, and it was also with this idea that these people that they were coming to take the lands from were savages and they were there to civilize them and 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 show them you know this whitewashed reimagined you know pictures of jesus with blonde hair and blue eyes you know this middle eastern man uh and 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 really try to make themselves be you know the dominant and the more superior race so that happened for centuries and and what happened you know after this doctrine of discovery other european monarchies then took the license to say hey we're going to use that to go ahead and and do the same thing throughout the world you know in africa and asia and all over the world um and so once you start getting that feeling of like i am the righteous race it starts to permeate in all levels of our society and, and, and even in those who are being colonized they start to think oh maybe you know i, I need to be more like that mm. you know that is the the right the way, way the right way to be yeah. i am so uncivilized and it's not you know so that's kind of where the roots of racism started in mm. terms of this idea of white supremacy of white being better than all other cultures mm. um I don't know where do I want to go from there. I, I know. <laughs> well, we do want to talk a little bit about maybe we could um, talk about a racism in the how it develops in the individual, um, and you kind of talked about oh, countries and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I I read a uh, something in a book a few years ago which really changed my life mm-hmm. because it caused me to reflect on myself. But it said um, all anger is based in fear. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, would you say this is related anyway to racism, or how does racism develop in an individual? And this is now going from the big picture to of more, Spain that's colonizing a great question, the world yeah. to uh, a child. Basically. Fantastic question. Um, so, in psychology, we have a theory that's called social learning theory, uh, and that is uh, the theory that people learn by observing and imitating others. Right? Mm. So that's how we learn. We, we see what mommy's doing, what daddy's doing, and then we learn you know, certain behaviors and, and so on and so forth with our peers and our society and, 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 and it goes on. Um, so when we have these you know, decades, centuries of people feeling that they're more superior than others, it, it also permeates into our own psyche of being better than. Um, and so these learned behaviors then kind of start to become a part of our thinking. Now, if I go back to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just, just kind of stick to the United States and, and talk about how that affects you individually. Um, you know, with African Americans, for example, they were brought to the United States for an economic need. There was a gap. Basically, when uh, the the U.S. was uh, was established, they needed, they I don't know if they needed, they wanted 
free labor. <laughs> and so what better way than to purchase sell, you know, yeah. slaves yeah. Uh, who were then treated as property, like cattle or, you yeah. know, sheep or whatever. Uh, and that's exactly how they were treated. They were less than human. Um, so once uh, there was the abolition, uh, when, once slavery was abolished in the U.S. Constitution, the 13th Amendment says slavery is abolished. And there's one little clause there that says, except for people who commit crimes. And what then started happening was after the abolition of straight slavery is that African Americans were being disproportionately arrested for the most minor infractions, their loitering, vagrancy. And all of a sudden you're having media, you know, these direct and indirect messaging going out in movies and film, you know, in, in film and in news, talking about the criminality of these African, these black people, you know, all these men are gonna come and rape your wife and kill your children and things of that nature. So that messaging then gets reinforced in our society. And so some people start if that's if you have minimal interactions of people of this different race, that's what you're going to start to believe, right. you know. Um, and you know, even just from a pers personal perspective, I was telling you, uh, I I, tr I kind of would start started to believe that myself. And, and I'm black, right? So you're like, well, what? You, but you're not originally from the U.S., right? You know, yeah, so tell I'm us a little bit about that. So I am from a small country in East Africa called Eritrea, and I was born and raised in Ethiopia. Um, and I so I came from a, a, major, you know, a, a place where the majority of people were black. So I, I never really had to think about my blackness. I never had to prove myself because I was black because everybody around me looked just like me. Mm -hmm. um, and so all the information I ever received about African Americans was through film and music, and it was about gangsters and crime. And, and so, so the way that they were being depicted in the news was always as being criminals, Stereo yeah, stereotyped. very stereotyped. Mm -hmm. So I even recall like before I, you know, I, I came to the United States when I was 17 for college and I remember having this like huge discussion with my family in terms of like being safe because I was going off on my own mm. and you know stay away from you know the African Americans we don't want you to get involved in drugs and, and it was because th that was the messaging that had been you know been put out systematically for decades yes you know so so it's it's natural for anybody to be you know to learn using that social learning theory to observe that and say oh that that's what it is right um and i truly believe that racism didn't exist you know i i honestly believed that african americans were just not doing you know like look at me i you know i'm in, i'm in college and i'm living in the united states they and do they, if, if they, if they just worked hard enough yeah. you know they could you know be where i am yeah. and so because i never experienced that so it's really hard for people who don't experience it to really empathize with the group that's saying hey listen i am being oppressed yeah. um and i i recall you know going to the mall with my best friend who uh was uh she was ecuadorian but she was white and i, I remember going and uh having a person follow me around the store and I was like gosh well this person is so helpful I, I'm like no I'm, I'm, I'm good <laughs> I'm, I don't need anything no thank you and, and she's following me I'm like god and and it was you know stifling but because I'd never experienced racism I didn't know that she was following me thinking that I was going to steal something yeah, from her you store she was trying to be helpful yeah. yeah so you know it was kind of a disconnect in terms of that and but then over time I'm like wow this per you know every time I go into especially a you know a high-end department store I was constantly being followed around where my friend was not. You know, mm -hmm. she was left to just shop freely after they're like, hey, welcome to our store. And then she's left to shop freely. I'm being followed around. Mm -hmm. and, and so it starts to, you know, you start to question, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe I was, you know, maybe there is something like uh, to that. I'm like, don't they know who I am? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and all of a sudden I went from being an individual where I grew up to being, you know, a minority group when, where, when I came to the United States. So, uh, you know, those kinds of experiences start to make you question, you know, in terms of like, well, maybe racism does exist, you know, maybe. And, and so you start to uh, to feel that way. Um, and then I had a very, uh, a very salient experience that really made me understand that it did exist. Um, and, it, and it's not a horrific experience, but it was something that really uh, shook me to my core uh, was when I, I had gotten my PhD. I was living in New York City at the time. And I went with a friend of mine who, uh, who was white, and he uh, just a, just a, just a comparison. So uh, he was white, uh, dropped out, had dropped out of high school, was unemployed, and here I am. I'm, I'm you know, I have a PhD. I'm employed at the university, teaching at the college, doing you know, fancy research and things like that. So 
another friend who was leaving his apartment, who's also white, had called me and said, hey, I'm leaving my apartment. I know you're looking for a place. Why don't you call my landlord and let him know? And I called the landlord. And, and obviously, when you talk to me on the phone, I sound very white. So this man was super excited. Wait, what does it mean to sound <laughs> very, very white? white? Right? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, he thought you were white. He, he thought I was white, okay. you know, just based on the way, my manner of speech. Okay. And he was super nice on the phone. He you know, yes, when can you come? I can't wait to show you the place, blah, blah, blah. And hung up the phone. We made a day to, to meet on a special day. And, and I went with this friend of mine, the one with the... With, the, the, with no job. The, the no job, the, G, the no GED person. Uh, and as we're walking, this person's standing outside of the building, you know, waiting for me so he can let me into the building. And I, and I get there and he immediately changed his demeanor. And he's... Uh, I'm like, hi, I'm Belul. I'm here to look at the place, and and, I, and he's like, oh wait, no, is this for you? Who's is this for him? And I said, no, no, no. And I thought, oh no, I'm not bringing him. He's just a friend of mine. Oh. He's just accompanying me. It's just for me. And it, I, I was so like, no, 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 don't worry. Thinking, you know, that he was concerned that I'm bringing an extra person to live in this place, where he was like, no, I don't want this black woman in my in my apartment building. And he wouldn't even let me into the building. And he just was like, sorry, no, you, you can't see it. And he just walked off. And it was the first time that I'd ever been completely judged based on the color of my skin. And initially, I was so con I was confused <laughs> to, put, to put it mildly. Because you weren't raised in. This I wasn't kind raised of in, in, in that kind of environment, so I was really confused by his actions. Like, and and I was like, wow, that is so weird. And just being totally naive, that's so weird. I'm like, but he, you know, he told me he was going to show it to me. I wonder. And and my friend was completely red in the face because he had grown up in the United States and he knew exactly what happened. Yeah. And he said he, and then he turned to me and he said he didn't show you the apartment because you're black, Belu. And I just, it still. I broke down in tears because I had never been judged that way in my entire life, you know, as just not seen as an individual. And, and that's when I realized, oh, it does exist. It's just, it, I'd never experienced it. And there are so many people in, this, <laughs> in the country who experience it on a daily basis, right? Uh, so, for, so, so that kind of helps to uh, move somebody in terms of their racial identity, in terms of being non-racist is to have those experiences. So for white people, in terms of their white racial identity development, um, there is a, you know, a psychologist came up with uh, this theory um, that talks about different stages that white people would go through in terms of becoming anti-racist. And in the first stage of this, of this theory, of this model, it's called the contact stage, where typically people would say they're colorblind. Race is not really an issue. You know, racism doesn't exist. I'm sure if we didn't acknowledge or discuss it, you know, wouldn't be it wouldn't be an issue. And a lot, and, and doesn't mean you go through any all these stages. You could be stuck on that first stage for all your life because you have minimal interactions with people of color and things of that nature. Now, if you experience uh, some kind of uh, if you have an experience that challenges that view, you can move on to the next stage, which is called the disintegration stage, where you start to realize that you're having these privileges based on your whiteness, right? Uh, and it can cause you to have feelings of guilt and shame about it, but still believe that you're not racist. Um, so an, an example would be, uh, you know, I'm not racist, but I don't really want my son or daughter to marry somebody of a minority group, right? Mm -hmm. So that feeling, you know, if you were not racist completely, would, why would you have those feelings, right? Um, and those feelings can either uh, catapult you towards positive action, where you combat that, said, "No, it's okay if my daughter does marry that," or it can, you know, move you into a negative uh, feelings. And if those negative feelings uh, persist, then you can move on to this next stage of this racial identity development, which is what we call reintegration. And in that phase, you start to just kind of dig in your heels and start blaming the victim. So if you're starting to understand that you have these white privileges, maybe it's because you deserve these privileges, and maybe it's because you know you start putting the blame on minority groups for the problems that they're that, that they have in in their lives. If they'd only pull themselves up by their bootstraps, like I did, you know, mm -hmm. kind of having that idea ideology, um, blaming the victim essentially. Um, so now, in order to move out of that, and, and you can be stuck in that stage for for the rest of your life, <laughs> right? And as, as many people, as, and I think there's many people in older generations that you hear them say things that are super racist. <laughs> You're like, oh my gosh, you know. Uh, anyways, uh, and so in order to move from that, from that stage into a more positive racial identity, usually is a, is a result of some kind of salient um, 
a experience or it could be something a painful encounter that you have like I did for example and that's where you start to uh, and that stage is called pseudo independence where you start to maybe I should talk to people of color and you know, maybe I should learn a little bit more about this and you start to question and you start to realize that you do have privileges in society that are based on solely based on the color of your skin and not on who you are mm -hmm. um, and in order to move on to the fifth and sixth stages which is the final two stages of immersion and autonomy you actively start to uh, seek social justice, you know, you're actively speaking out against racial inequality, you're understanding that there are privileges that exist in your life that are based based on the color of your skin. And I know every time people hear white privilege, they sometimes tend to bristle at the, I'm like, I don't have privilege, I'm poor, you know, I struggled all my life. And it's like, yes, we're not saying that because you're white, your life was not hard. Mm -hmm. We're just saying that your skin color is not the additional thing making your life harder, mm -hmm. right? So. Um, so does that kind of answer your question in terms of like how those experiences, those indirect and direct messaging that you receive throughout your life really start to form your opinion on people of different minorities. And when we think about uh, white uh, racial identity, you know, it's not a conversation that uh, many families really articulate. You don't, especially in the United States, because they are the majority. You don't have to articulate your whiteness because mm. the U.S. culture is based and centered around white norms. Mm. You know, so whiteness is seen as a positive. Uh, is seen in a positive light. We're all expected to act or emulate whiteness in terms of our dress, our speech, our behaviors, our attitudes, you know, our actions, and so. For white people, they don't necessarily see that as an, uh, they don't see themselves in this group, they're just being regular Americans, and mm. if pe other people should just be regular Americans, mm. right? Um, so when a white person will, uh, you know, uh, commit some kind of atrocity, it's attributed to the individual. What happened in their family? What were the circumstances that caused this person to go and shoot all these people in a black church or in a movie theater? Um, whereas, um, minorities are not really afforded that consideration. You're pretty much lumped into being black or Asian or Arab. And so the atrocities committed by one person now become representative of your whole group. Oh, they're all criminals or they're all terrorists and things of that nature. Um, yeah, so those are some of the factors I think that really play into how racism really develops. Going back to your experience with uh, trying to lease this, this residence in, in New York, how did how did that and did that or how did that affect you as a person when you had this realization that you were being treated poorly because of basically you looked different than what people wanted you to look like mm -hmm. um, it, it really started to make me learn a little bit more you know I uh, I really never wanted to study or listen or anything about any racial injustice because, I was, you know, for me it was just being made up. It wasn't really happening. Uh, and I really appreciate your honesty. Yeah, you. you know, because I, I, you know, I, I think I didn't grow up in that. <laughs> right, and you know, so you know, racism doesn't really only you know affect white people. It's it affects you know people of color. You know, so so. Uh, a, Sorry if I'm digressing, but I just want to give it's a, okay. <laughs> a, a and, I'll, and I'll come back to, to your question. Uh, you know, so a, a great example was a study was done in the 40s uh, where they wanted to look at the effects of, you know, segregation and racism on black people. Like, how does it affect your own self-esteem? And they did what was called the doll test. And the doll test was uh, they gave... And, and this was all solely done with African-American children between the ages of three to six. So what they did was they'd give four dolls uh, of different shades of color and they would ask the kids one identify the race and tell me which one you want you prefer to play with and overwhelmingly the majority of children chose the white doll and they attributed positive characteristics to that white doll and, and negative characteristics to dolls that were of their own color so that is the messaging that is really affecting you know how people see themselves right uh, so in order to you know so in, there's and I see that here as well is the idea of like lighter is better you know so I, I see tons of bleaching creams in our stores <laughs> so you could be more fair skin or have good hair which means straight hair mm -hmm. <laughs> you know so uh, you know those kinds of messaging starts to really you know impact how people start to view themselves and uh, and I think for me I started to embrace my naturalness 
uh, I used to always straighten my hair, always. I never had curly hair all my life. Because, you know, it's like, oh, even till this day, my mother's like, get your hair done. Why is your hair? Your hair is so beautiful. I think so, yeah. too. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's that, I, it's, it's that message yeah, that yeah. we've received for centuries yeah. that, you know, we want to look you know don't go out in the sun you want to protect yourself don't get too dark and yeah. you know i still have to tell myself it's okay to be dark i like yeah. being dark we just don't want age spots <laughs> yeah you, i mean <laughs> you know put on the sunscreen and and you know it's okay but the idea is that the being darker is not prettier mm. you know it's the idea that being lighter is prettier mm -hmm. uh, that having the straight hair is nicer mm -hmm. you know so putting all these chemicals in your you know and not uh, embracing who you are and so that's what i've started that 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 is one of the results of that experience is just trying to embrace my blackness you know mm. I'm being loving who I am just as I am let's talk a little bit about the civil unrest that's happening mm -hmm. um, and again people are looking at this in different ways some people and I, I think it's also attributed to the media but uh, talk to us about civil unrest protests riots okay what is civil unrest uh, civil unrest, it, you know, it's a contagion that develops when social, economic, and political stress accumulates slowly over time, and then it's released spontaneously in the in the form of social unrest, such as protests and riots. Um, so a riot could also be civil unrest. Then. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, there, you know, it's it's uh, when somebody is rioting, they're expressing anger. Yes. You know. um, whether it's justifiable or not, are two different things, right? So you know, some riots, for example, after your team loses a football game, seems kind of trivial to me, yeah. <laughs> you know, which a lot of, <laughs> that just happened, you know, all over the world. But other riots in terms of these, like, systemic oppression, because you're not being heard. Yeah. It's the voice, and I, I think Martin Luther King said it, you know, the riot is the, the voice of the, you know, I can't say exactly. I, and people are going to kill me if they see this, but, <laughs> but I can't. Voice of the oppressed. The I'll voice of the it's oppressed. The voice of the oppressed. <laughs> well, in some cases, sometimes rise, like you said, in the case of a football match, that's that's just crazy. Um, yeah, so, yeah. But and but the thing about unrest, these uh, uh, unrest events, is historically they do bring about significant societal and cultural changes. And we see that, for example, in the '60s with the civil rights movement, uh, it, it brought about you know the the ending of legalized segregation. Uh, in in Eastern European countries in the 1980s, civil unrest brought about the fall of communism. You know, in 2010 in North Africa and Libya, Egypt, Tunisia, it brought about the toppling of these authoritarian dictatorships and it's simply when they when they've used legal channels or they've used you know more uh, more civil channels to to try and address these issues have not been heard it can lead to these kinds of protests and and, uh, and riots how do you find the balance um, or maybe another way to say it is what is when somebody is protesting and they're looting for example is this still something we see that can bring about a positive change in communities this st uh, it, well you said it is still considered civil unrest but mm -hmm. uh, yeah <laughs> so basically you know, you know I, they're breaking the law obviously they're breaking the law because they're protesting and they're rioting mm -hmm. but have we seen that this can also bring about good if they're protesting right. something that's not right if they're looting yeah this is a deep question <laughs> i want to see how you answer this one uh, you know <laughs> So first, I don't think that we should be conflating the protesters with the looters. Okay, <laughs> I guess that's what I was trying to say, yes. You know, a, a significant majority of the protests have been peaceful, but you know, the media tends to focus on the looting yeah. and, and, and sensationalizing that. And I think the question that we need to ask about looting is, it's not really what's happening, but why is it happening? Why is it? in one of the richest, most powerful countries in the nation that people don't have what they need. To, they, they feel driven to, to steal, which is basically what looting is, right? Yeah. You know, why don't we or they, see- what they want. Right, so why don't we see, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos out in the street looting? Why is Oprah Winfrey not there, Obama or Donald Trump looting on the streets? Because they have everything they need to get by in life, right? So looting a lot of times is, you know, I, I can talk about it from a psychological perspective as well. Yes. 
Uh, so, you know, some psychologists argue that there is a loss of moral identity when you're in large groups and there's chaos going around. Mm. And it's this mob mentality, I think. You know, some people say mob mentality. And it's the idea that, you know, you're kind of anonymous uh, and, uh, you know, the normal rules don't apply in terms of, you know, when chaos is happening around you. But you really have to look at, you know, uh, you know, these these communities have been deprived of so many things for so long and if a, there's a broken window and I'm seeing that iPhone 7 or what, what iPhone are we on now 12 <laughs> whatever it is at least 10 <laughs> well, you I know a 9 that's all I can you know and and you know so it could be you know so all of a sudden the, the, these two emotions of empathy and guilt you know, empathy, you know, feeling for others and guilt, feeling bad about doing something bad, uh, get corroded in these kinds of chaotic environments. So if you're s given an opportunity to get something that you need, maybe it's to meet a basic necessity, like you mm. might want to sell it off or food because you need to eat, uh, you know, those can contribute. Those can be the motivations. There's various motivations. That could be some of the motivations for looting. Um, or and greed. Or greed. Well, I don't know if it's greed necessarily. Well, because it not everything that's being looted may be needed right uh but i you know i i think they're you know you can kind of get swept away in in the moment as well to to, to some degree and a lot of times you'll see that people who are stealing uh we'll call it what it is who are stealing <laughs> are wouldn't have done that in 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 any other fashion but now all of a sudden they're given the opportunity to do so and we really can't also because that's there might be some forms of human nature in that you know getting so if, if it's right there and all of a sudden I see all these people walking around with a, you know flat screen TV and well okay you know mm -hmm. so you might be motivated to act on, on actions that you would otherwise not do right um, and and it, and a lot of times you know some people are can be in survival mode uh, we're looking at you know right now we're it's one of the worst times economically for the United States I mean the number of people who are unemployed the number of people who are dying from the pandemic the number of people who are locked down these are all frustrations that can really feed into uh, you know the the looting you know but I, I really feel like that we should be mm. focusing on if we had the social systems in place yeah people would not be looting. They wouldn't feel the need to loot. They would have what they need. They don't, they don't need to get more, right? So if you had healthcare, if you had a job, if you had money, uh, if you had all your basic necessities met, met you, you'd probably just you know, kind of go along with it. Um, and we really can't also ignore you know, the reports of outside agitators, as they're called. Um, there have been reports of white supremacy groups that are coming in breaking windows to, to kind of, you know, encourage people to come in and, 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 and see from the stores. Some have blamed it on anti-fascist groups like Antifa. You know, so there are people who are also banking on this, you know, great raw emotion that a lot of people are experiencing at this time and taking advantage of their um, psychological state. I, I, I like how you kind of brought in also the psychology of people, like why they do that when they may not normally do that. And, and also the point about, um, the structures because like for example here in the Marianas I can't really see people doing that because we're so close-knit like everybody knows everybody <laughs> so yeah. if you do anything like somebody's gonna recognize you and you're gonna be <laughs> yeah. busted so I think that's part of like a um, the anonymity yeah mm -hmm. it would take away that that part of it but you know uh, the thing is when people are desperate they ask they'll act in desperate ways mm. you know so I, I wouldn't say that you know the Marianas is completely immune from ever experiencing some you yeah. know that kind of looting mentality like so you know if we have a complete breakdown in our economic settings and people are are hungry hungry yeah. you know you know literally and figuratively they will do whatever they need to survive yeah so it, it's completely understandable to me I'm not saying it's right. It's just understandable. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. Uh, when it comes to civil unrest, are there any, um, and I don't know if this topic is too broad, uh, but um, are there any qualities of civil unrest that tend to make some more successful in bringing about social change than, than others? Like, for example, does civil always re unrest, in order for it to be successful and bring about change, does it always have to have a leader, like Martin Luther King? Mm -hmm. Or are you aware of I mean, the dynamics? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think for civil unrest to be successful, you absolutely need leadership. You need organization and you need endurance to, la to, to last it out because the powers that be are always resistant to change. You know, they want to keep things just as they are. They prefer the status quo. So you have to have that kind of leadership. Um, and if you... and 
and leadership can be from the top, in, you know, presidency, meaning if you're putting, and I keep going back to social systems because, it, you know, a lot of times th these are economic issues. Yeah. You know, these are economic issues that are being expressed, you know, in terms of rioting and protesting and things like that. Uh, so if you have the leadership that's, you know, putting all those systems in place, making sure that everything is e equal amongst all groups that exist in this society, you, you probably won't have mm -hmm. those kinds of issues um, occurring. So, um, you know, in order for it to fail, you, I think, uh, a lot of times what has happened historically is uh, the systematical removal of the effective leaders. Um, so even when we're thinking of the civil rights movement, uh, you know, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And, you know, I, it's interesting how historic, you know, in, now we look at Martin Luther King as this beloved figure by all, and he simply was not. <laughs> he was demonized back in the day in the media, uh, you know, as rested several times, people did not like him in, in, in the majority community, not in the African American community, but, you know, they, they really did not like him. So, it, and now it's, it's, oh, he's peaceful, he's this, and, you know, it's like this revisionist history, and I was like, yeah, it, now you see it that way, but mm -hmm. back then you didn't. So, um, you know, so they effectively were removing all the effective leaders who were trying to bring about this, uh, this, this, this change. Um, but, you know, it didn't work because people had had enough, right? Yeah, so that's where the endurance comes in. Yeah, so what happened, even though he was assassinated, how did, how were we able to, <laughs> I'm about to say overcome, but that's like, <laughs> such a fun. How was, uh, how were we able as a nation to find success success in that movement, even though the, the leader in Martin Luther King was assassinated. Yeah, so, you know, th thankfully, you know, even though you might have, like, one prominent leader, there are leaders within communities, right, within your local communities mm -hmm. that can still galvanize. And, and I think, you know, having the buy-in from everybody, understanding that, hey, this is not fair. You know, in, in, for the civil rights movement, it was this whole idea of being separate but equal. You know, blacks only here, whites only there, school, you know. So, in order to, to combat that, you have to have you know, a shift in, 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 in thinking by the society as a whole, saying, you know what, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. What's happening is not right, you yeah. know. Do you think that's what's happening now? Yes, I do. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, I think uh, a lot of times when people are, are looking at this Black Lives Matter movement, they're thinking that it's only black people that are there. But if you look, if you look at any of these videos, or these protests, it is very multicultural. Yeah. It is everybody who's saying, hey, I have seen enough black people being killed on TV by police, you know, or, you know, by whoever, uh, white supremacist, supremacists, you know. Yeah. So uh, it's this idea that, hey, th this is an issue. Th this keeps coming up. This is not an anomaly. This isn't some criminal. It's happening systematically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think is going to be necessary um, to bring about the change that these protests are aiming for? Do you think it's possible? Absolutely. You know, <laughs> I, I, you know, you have to have hope, <laughs> right? Uh, I do think it's possible. I, is it going to be overnight? I, you know, probably not. But uh, I, I, sometimes you really have to force the hand of the people in power in order to make the changes that they need to make. Um, you know, because, you know, right now, I think what, you know, has been contributing to the persistence of this racial inequality is is the powers that play, you know, the powers that play, which is uh, in the United States, we're ruled by an oligarchy, which means people who have money are the ones who are making the laws, who are, you know, who, who, who make the rules. And if the, the ma but they're, they're few compared to the masses of people. So if we are all forcing their hand, they will have no choice but to make those changes. What would you say would be the next step that we could look forward to or that we sh would press for if we wanted to further this agenda of bringing about social change. You know, change. I, I think that uh, we need to keep at it. You know, the endurance part, I cannot stress how we need to keep at it until those changes are brought about. You cannot be placated by just, you know, uh, little diversionary uh, things to just say, okay, well, we'll, we'll, make some, we'll, we'll just change the police department here. No, it's a systemic issue. You need to change mm. the system. Mm. <laughs> the system needs to be changed. You need to provide equal opportunity for people to or access to to good education you need to have access to health care you need to have access to f quality food you know i mean it, just when you're even thinking about grocery stores uh when you walk into a grocery store things that are more expensive are fruits and vegetables that may keep you healthy yeah. right but i can buy spent you know ramen noodles for 35 cents you yes. know and so if i'm poor i don't have the money am i gonna you know spend you know 
three dollars or four ninety nine on an avocado, <laughs> or am I gonna buy like you know fifty packages of ramen or whatever the mm -hmm, case may be? Mm -hmm. So those are the inequities that we're seeing. So those systems need to be changed. We need to provide the infrastructure for uh, people who are being uh, affected by these inequities to thrive. Yeah. That's, yeah. That will be a huge change and a huge task. Yeah. Coming back again to the personal, from the macro to the micro, could you leave us with a few thoughts, maybe two or three thoughts for, for us to take and reflect on on our own to, to see if we do have racist attitudes mm -hmm. and what we might do to um, overcome them? You know, I think the first step is to listen. You know, I think just listen to the people who are telling you that they're hurting. You know, a lot of times, because you haven't experienced something doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? So uh, I'll give a, a, a different example. So if, 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 I, uh, if a friend of mine comes and tells me, uh, my husband is beating me, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm a, and I say, well, my husband isn't, husband isn't beating me, so this can't really, and none of my Does friends, other, really the, I don't think any of my other I've friends' husbands it, are beating them, you know, yeah, so yeah. just because wow. I personally, great example. <laughs> so just because I personally didn't experience it doesn't mean it's not an issue, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, so just listen, you know, actively learn and talk about race, it's, it, it has become such a divisive issue and it really shouldn't be, you know, because we're all really part of the human race, right, <laughs> so just listening to others, I think, and, and being able to actively learn um, is, is really important. I think it's important to also build capacity. You know, on institutional levels, you need to start building capacity. Um, what do you, you mean by that? You need to be able to uh, provide the opportunities for those, uh, for these positions of power, equal representation in government, and in, in all forms of powerful positions, um, because it's hard for, you need to have the perspective of different, pers of different minority groups experiences, experiences yeah. to to really uh, be effective you know in, in, in bringing about uh, social and racial you know social justice and racial justice um, what else I you know also I think that there needs to be a, a chance for people you know and they're doing that now but to to really have their grievances acknowledged you know, to, to try and make amends. And I think, you know, people talk about reparations um, and reparations is the idea of, you know, somehow paying back, not necessarily monetarily, but in some way to the hurt that's been brought, brought about by these racial inequities. And it's really about the process as well of reparations, you know, acknowledging that the hurt has been done, making amends, changing the system, things of that nature, uh, in order to move forward and then whatever form that reparations take is, you know, up to the powers that be, right? Um, and, and it's really important, I think, to decolonize your mind. You know, I think that there have, uh, for far too long, <laughs> people have been uh, not valuing their culture uh, in ways uh, that they should, you know, c considering them in some ways it, this other culture is better, you know. Uh, so I think it's really important to uh, decolonize your mind. And, and I'll, I'll, I, this is a, an example that my husband always uses, and I love it, you know, just to make it relevant to here. And, I, and please forgive me if I'm not saying his name wrong, uh, if I'm saying his name wrong, but uh, Matapang, is that yes. Matapang? Is that, he, was a, he was a Magalahi, but, you a know. Chamorro chief. A Chamorro chief, yes. yes. And, uh, Today, when we look at the, when we see that term mat, uh, matapang, it, yeah. it essentially means somebody who's rude, stuck up, stuck kinda, up yeah. you know, so it, it has all these negative connotations associated with that word. But when you think of what matapang did historically, the chief himself, he, all he did was he was resisting the Spanish who were coming to take his land and, you know, slowly take away his culture, right? So it's to decolonize your mind in that sense, right? Um, and one is, and another thing that we should also, to, as a takeaway, is is, you know hold yourself accountable you know everybody has biases you know we all have it we, we we that's how our brains work we categorize things you know based on you know and it could be explicit meaning that you are aware of these attitudes and stereotypes that you hold as being positive or negative or it could be implicit which is more unconscious mm -hmm. and we that's the one that's harder to identify the unconscious implicit biases that we hold um, so a, a great example would be 
uh, in 2018 in Seattle, for example, uh, two men, African American, walked into a Starbucks and they're waiting for somebody for a business deal. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of the story, yeah, yes, right? Yes. Uh, and and the barista the, at Starbucks was like, well, you know, what do you, you know, what do you want? I said, oh no, we're waiting for somebody. And she then went, you know, after a while of them waiting and not ordering anything, she started to feel very uncomfortable and then called the police. And six police officers came and told these people, these men to leave the Starbucks. And they said, why, why should we leave? We're waiting for a client, this and that. And eventually they got handcuffed and they were arrested. Mm -hmm. Now the question to ask is, was that barista racist? What was it about these two men sitting at the Starbucks that made her feel so uneasy that she called the police on them? You know, if there was, if it was two white girls sitting there said, oh, we're just waiting for our friend, would she have said, done the Let same the would she have yeah. called the police so those are the kinds of biases that we also have to really hold ourselves accountable for our, our you know our reactions when something makes us uncomfortable when we start crossing the street when we see a you know a group of black men or whatever some you know we have to ask ourselves why am i doing this what you know so that's when you start to really start to reflect on your own biases in order to start the, the change that we, we need to see yeah and that's and that's not necessarily a, a comfortable process no but if we're willing to be honest with each other like I just a short story so like I grew up in something that was very common to say in my family when somebody would give you something and then take it back I don't know if you've ever heard of this phrase but we'd call it an Indian giver <laughs> and then you know you're an Indian giver you know you gave me that shirt and then like to my sister or whatever and then and then when I went to college and I had a roommate who was Native American and and when I came back one summer and I used that term right away, I realized, wow, that is totally inappropriate yeah. and because I, I don't think I knew any Native Americans up until then. Yeah. And I didn't think badly of them, but I realized like, wh why am I saying this? Yeah. And, yeah. and and it, maybe it's a cultural thing, like, you know, in, in the local culture in the old days, and even today, a lot of times it was like communal ownership of mm -hmm. things, like, mm -hmm. or, you know, so maybe it was a cultural thing that you could give something and then you expect it back. Or, but I just, it was so, I, and I was really embarrassed that I had been saying this like all my life up until that point, but I, I don't, I don't use it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So getting back to what you were saying about like be be brave to look at the language that you're you're using and really reflect yeah. on is this really fair is this really appropriate yeah and if necessary make changes and, and and the important thing is like even you know after you've come to terms with those kinds of biases the really what's really important for uh is for minority groups to feel supported you know so be courageous speak out you know, against any injustice that you're seeing in the world. Don't say, well, that's how it is. That's how, you know, it's not how it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, I like that. Yeah, you know, have the courage. Yeah, because yeah. we can even do that here. There's a lot we can improve on here in the Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so when you're seeing a family member saying something derogatory, if you're seeing an action, you know, people are saying something and you really need to call them out for it. And it's, and it's, and it's very hard to, to, to change minds, you know, so it, it takes courage to do so. Yeah. Yeah. I've really enjoyed our chat today. Thank you so much for having me. This was a pleasure. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts, anything else you'd like to add before we go? Uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I'm just really glad that I had the opportunity to kind of share my thoughts. I'm, I'm no mean, by no means a racial expert, you know, <laughs> but uh, those are just kind of my takeaways based on my yeah. experiences. Very valuable and a great foundation for the conversation and the series coming up. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. We've been chatting today with Dr. Bell 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 thank you, <laughs> Solomon. She's an associate professor at Northern Marianas College School of Education, talking about racial equality and civil unrest. And I do want to mention that uh, this project was made possible by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council through the National Endowment for the Humanities. And our views and conclusions are our own, they're not mm -hmm. of the council. Um, but we really do appreciate you participating in this discussion. Thank you. And we will see you next time with, uh, as we further our discussion on this important topic. And you're welcome to submit your comments. So thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>